Good evening and welcome to Big Tent Live Events, our live online event series from the University of Oxford, brought to you by the Humanities Cultural Programme, itself one of the founding stones for the future Stephen A. Schwartzman Centre for the Humanities. My name is Wes Williams and I'm Director of Torch, the Oxford Research Centre in the Humanities and a Professor of French Literature. Tonight, in our final Big Tent Live event for this term, we bring you Democracy, Fragility, Conspiracy, three themes for our times. I'm delighted to be joined now by our expert speakers this evening. First off, Homi Baba, who is, as most of you will know, a compelling and engaging critical voice. Working, worrying away at the knot formed by the intersection of theoretical, aesthetic and political experience embodied as his work is in questions, institutions, and experimental interventions such as this very conversation today. He is the Anne F. Rothenberg Professor of Humanities in the English and Comparative Literature Departments at Harvard University. And he was one of the very first internationally renowned thinkers who took up our invitation to join us in the big tent back in lockdown version one, when he encouraged us to think about being unprepared. Welcome back, homie to our big tent. Joining Homie in this transatlantic conversation will be two professors, uh, Elizabeth, two professors here from Oxford. First, Elizabeth Fraser from the Department of Politics and International Relations. I'll wait till you come on screen. Hello, Elizabeth. Hi. Secondly, uh, oh, this is also a fellow of New College. And then secondly, Wale Adabanwi, a fellow of St. Anthony's College professor of race relations and the former director of the African Studies Centre here in Oxford. Welcome to you both. Thank you. Yes. Um, Homi, I'm just going to say you're looking at the wrong screen as it were, or is there another way in which, yes, if you look at this screen, we can see you. Um, no, it's the other way around. Uh, there we are, that one. Um, there we are, I'm being the cameraman now. Um, we can sort this out in a minute. Um, joining Homie then, as I say, are these two um, uh, professors from Oxford. Welcome to you both. And I'm especially pleased as well to say that tonight's event will be chaired by Stephen Tuck, Professor of Modern History with a focus on US history and Fellow of Pembroke College. Stephen, who has now just joined the screen, was the founding director of Torch. And already at that, for us, early stage, he launched the Race and Resistance Programme a program that is at the core of much, much of what we still do in Torch. And it's a great pleasure to continue this work, these conversations via the Humanities Cultural Program today. In the context of ongoing transatlantic and indeed global work on race and resistance, I want before handing over to Stephen to acknowledge the painful timeliness again of our discussion here today. In the wake of yesterday's vicious, prepared and deadly attack in Atlant Atlanta, targeting members of the Asian, Asian American and Pacific Islander community in particular. As I know we will discuss today, such violence is at once painfully contemporary and has a history. Our collective commitment as scholars in the humanities, social sciences and politics, scholars devoted to the advancement of knowledge and understanding of the human condition, means that we have a vital role to play in not only resisting, but also countering all that drives racist violence. To echo and adapt the words posted on the Harvard website earlier today, this struggle belongs to and behoves all of us. I'll disappear now from the screen and I'm delighted to hand over to you, Stephen, to get the discussion started. Thank you all. Thank you, Wes, and thank you uh, especially for those words. It's a great pleasure to be back at Torch, on screen at least, for this event. And I'd like to add my own welcome to the panel and to everybody watching. It's a particular pleasure for me to welcome Homi Baba, who was director of Harvard's Torch, so to speak, when Oxford's Torch was founded. And Homi gave generously of his time and his ideas as we started up. So thank you, Homi, for all your help then and great for pleasure. joining us today. It's a great pleasure. As Wes said, we've come together to discuss a vitally important topic and tragically such a timely one. So let me explain the format of what's gonna happen. 
In a moment, I'll invite Homi to share some thoughts on democracy, fragility, and conspiracy. Elizabeth Fraser and Walia Dibamwe will respond with their comments and questions, which will then lead into a conversation between the panelists before we have an open question and answer session uh, to finish. So if you would like to forward any questions um, or comments at any point, please put them in a YouTube live chat just below the screen here. And our hope is to include as many questions as, and comments as we can before we finish at about 6 p.m. So that's the format. And without any more ado, I'll hand over to Professor Homi Baba. Homi, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to thank you all. I want to thank the Torch team, Holly and Maya. I want to thank Wes, um, who has been such a intellectual companion and friend over the uh, pandemic. Wes, uh, I really owe you and Torch the opportunity uh, you've given me of, of thinking about issues as they have arisen over the last year. Thank you so much. You've kept me thinking. What is Stephen and Elizabeth? So kind of you to get together, and I'm greatly looking forward to our conversation. Let me begin then. President Biden's inaugural address made frequent references to the fragility of democracy. In his first presidential town hall with CNN's Anderson Cooper, five weeks later, Biden returned to the subject of democratic fragility. In the days between these two warnings of the perilous state of democracy, all of America and much of the rest of the world witnessed the pageantry of the vandalism of the US Capitol on January the 6th. Is the fragility of democracy any different from our ongoing apprehensions about the fate of democracy or the future of democracy? Does the phrase democratic fragility strike a different note of alarm. I believe it does. The value of words lies in using them cautiously and reading them carefully. Phrases like the future of democracy anticipate the next chapter of the democratic experiment, however dark and difficult it may be. It may not be business as usual, but there is little doubt that our view of democracy is still in business. The fragility of democracy expresses the anxiety that for the present moment, and there had been such moments before and there will be, democracy as a political idea and a repertoire of normative practices may not only be losing ground, but may be losing the plot altogether. Well into February, three quarters of Republican voters still believe the lie that the American election was stolen. Now on January the 6th, the Make America Great Again MAGA mob mounted, as you know, an assault on electoral rights and democratic institutions in the name of all Americans, threatening to hang the vice president in the process. They were responding, as the case for Trump's impeachment made plain, to a carefully crafted call to arms from Trump himself. We fight like hell. And if we don't fight like hell, you're not going to have a country anymore. Trump beat the war drums to egg his followers on to fight the courts with frivolous petitions, to fight the Constitution with fraudulent actions, to fight the election with insurrection. The story, for me, doesn't end there. Trump's January the 6th speech contains, as far as I'm concerned, a dark racial conceit that suggests that America is now in danger of sinking to the status of a third world country. Those nations um, <clears throat> that he once called shithole countries. It's a disgrace. There's never been anything like it, Trump hollers. You should take a look at third world countries. Just take a look. Take third world countries. Their elections are the most, uh, their elections are more honest than what we've been going through in this country now. It's a disgrace. It's a disgrace. 
Now, after ranting against his bete noir, Biden, Romney, Romney, Hillary Clinton, Trump turns on those black Americans, faux Americans to a person, as I believe he sees it, who are most responsible for America's impending third world doom. Who are they? Of course, he turns to the state of Georgia, which was his final humiliation, and to Stacey Abrams. And he says, and then I had to beat Stacey Abrams with this guy, Brian Kemp. I had to beat Stacey Abrams and I had to beat Oprah, used to be a friend of mine. And I had a campaign against Michelle Obama and Barack Hussein Obama. Now the devil lurks in the details. You can almost hear Trump saying, are black Americans really American citizens at all? Or are they more like third world people? Does Barack Hussein, 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 Hussein even sound American to you? Trump never tires of asking. As I watch the insurrection head on in real time, the Black Lives Matter protests of the summer were never far from my mind. Why? Because the MAGA mob had chosen as their totemic symbol, their monument, the lynching gallows. The gallows and the Confederate flag were the standards they raised against the election result. It was, no question about it, the gallows and the Confederacy that they associated with Trump's restoration. While the attention of the world was focused on the violent breaking of the Capitol, it was the gallows with its twisted hanging noose and its dire history of racial death that caught my eye. Hang them. Stop the steal was meant for Democratic senators and Republicans, never Trumpers. But the dire reality of American racial death haunted the MAGA monument of gallows and noose. Black death by lynching or police chokeholds or shots in the back. Native American deaths by genocide and territorial dispossession. And only last night, East Asian, South Asian, Pacific Islanders, um, uh, American Asians who were actually killed and threatened. Trump protesters mockingly appropriated, I can't breathe, Floyd's dying words to express their discomfort at being tear gassed as they broke into the Capitol. In a tableau macabre, two MAGA members enacted Floyd's death beneath a Black Lives Matter banner on the 6th displayed as it was at the National City Christian Church in DC before they participated in the storming of the Capitol. The racism structured into every aspect of the coup attempt is a call to heed our own history. The Yale historian Timothy Snyder writes in the American Abyss, his remarkable account of that January day. Now, the United States of America is by no means the only country vulnerable to democratic fragility. The insurrection of the capital signals the fragility of democracy in other ethno-nationalist regimes across the world, most recently in Myanmar, repeatedly in Hungary, Poland, Turkey, India, Israel, and Brazil. There is, of course, no one-size-fits-all model for authoritarian regimes, but what they share are tyrannical male leaders whose principal line of attack is an assault on minorities, migrants, and dissidents, what they consider to be a world of enemies. These leaders, populist narcissists to a man, share a political ideology that Hannah Arendt once described as tribal nationalism. She wrote that tribal nationalism is introverted. It concentrates on the individual's own soul, which is considered as the embodiment of general national politics. Tribalism, she goes on to say, starts from non-existent pseudo-mystical elements, which it proposes to realize fully in the future. It can be easily recognized by the tremendous arrogance inherent in its self-concentration. Politically speaking, she ends, tribal nationalism always insists that its own people is surrounded by a world of enemies, one against all, 
that a fundamental difference exists between this people and all others. It claims its people to be unique, individual, incompatible with all others, and denies theoretically the very possibility of a common mankind long before it is used to destroy the humanity of man. While the world's press was counting Trump's lies, 30,573 untruths in four years, the Washington Post reports, Trump's rhetoric of untruth was loudly and restlessly doing its work. The untruths uttered by tribal nationalists have no real epistemic stakes or stakes in making a political argument. Their ambitions, more rhetorical than epistemic, are largely affective and enunciative. They belong to the moment in which they are spoken again and again and again. To accuse ethno-nationalist populist leaders of not telling the truth is, I believe, to miss the point of their arrogant self-concentration, which is almost entirely to not with telling the truth or untruth, but with selling themselves. Their public imagos and political brands are constructed to transgress party systems or bipartisan politics and to transgress the national interest. This, I think, is what Arendt means when she considers tribal nationalist leaders to be introverted, elevating themselves as embodiments of general national qualities at the cost of the multi-ethnic interfaith tradition of a nation's peoples, their visible existence, their traditions, their institutions and cultures. Leaders who resist press conferences, who insist on the platform and performance of the rally as their prime way of communicating, and who transact policy through Twitter, seek to turn citizens into sycophants and the nation's people into partisan mobs. These leaders are arbiters of power who thrive on the arbitrariness of governance to keep citizens and residents in states of anxiety and unpreparedness in times of emergency. The Chinese government, as you know, concealed the outbreak of the coronavirus in Wuhan for weeks, leaving vulnerable inhabitants exposed to the virus, unprepared for pandemic, morbidity and mortality. The Indian government gave migrant workers and wage laborers four hours between 8 p.m. and midnight on March the 24th to de-densify the cities and head to their villages in order to be locked down, often without food, money, or transport. Ethno-nationalist rhetoric in its rabble-rousing recruiting mode is based, as Arendt said, on non-existent pseudo-mystical elements. COVID will disappear like a miracle in April, Trump prophesied. Light a lamp for nine minutes on April the 5th to ward off the pandemic, India's Prime Minister Modi advised, and join in Vedic prayer. Lead us from unreal to real, from darkness to light, from death to immortality. Death, be not proud, I say, just be untruthful, is the tribal leader's adage. When truths and facts are pitted against untruths and conspiracies, populist leaders and their followers brazen it out. Untruth disregards evidence, science, deliberation, and due process because the tribalist national promise to its own unique people, one against all, is the achievement of a racially pure and culturally homogenous nation in the future. In the future, that futurity is really important because populist power articulated in the language of untruth wages the perils of the present against a promised yet provisional future. There is always a political and psychic risk involved in such a promissory bet on an uncertain future like Trump's loss in the 2021 elections. So the anxiety associated with future risk requires a blind belief in the followers, in the Trumpers, in untruths uttered in the present moment. 
time is as much an instrument of the tyranny of tribalism as is the politics of place and people. When the promise of the present doesn't come to pass, then all hell breaks loose and the intimidatory maneuvers of the police force assume a directly political role. In some countries, the army is called in at this point and democracy dies. In others, the violence of the desire for electoral autocracy makes its symbolic present felt in the hanging gallows and the swinging noose. Make America great again. Make Hindu India Hindu again. Take back control and make Britain a sovereign nation again, 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 again. It is the futurity of the again and the yet to come that drives tyrannical leaders to the risks with to take risks with inflationary cycles of untruth that put the lives and livelihoods of their followers at risk. Over 315 members of the MAGA group are now facing criminal charges. Over 500,000 Americans, as you know, have died of this little miraculous flu. This is to say nothing of the everyday risks faced by ethnic minorities from white supremacists, as we saw last night, who see the world of minorities and dissidents as a world of enemies. January the 6th does not reveal the sudden fragility of American democracy, not at all. It is symptomatic of the structural failures within American democracy. This is the American nightmare from which the American dream never fully wakes. The shadow of death, as we know, does not enter the corridors of power uninvited. When a political system hinders the people's right to speak truth to power, by alleging that dissent is sedition, protest is anti-national, and peaceful demonstrators are anti-patriotic anarchists, then dogmatism and democracy destroy the checks and balances of representative democracy. What we have at such point are allegations, allegations, and allegations all the way. Allegation defines the world of minorities, mauled by indignity, inequality, and psychic injury. Allegations attached to skin color, gender, and race. Allegations exploiting inequalities of caste and class. Allegations against religious and political affiliations. Allegations related to the embodiments of gender and sexuality. The content of allegations after allegations after allegations may seem outrageously untruthful. But as the poet Claudia Rankine writes, these fantasies cost lives, as the American record of recent police killings of black people attests. And I recite from her poem, Citizen, in memory of Jordan Russell Davis, in memory of Eric Garner, in memory of John Crawford, in memory of Michael Brown, in memory, in memory, in memory, in memory. Systemic racism is also mentioned by her. In memory, in memory, in memory, because white men can't police their imagination, black men are dying. Systemic racism leans heavily on legal justice and policy reform, but the phenomenology of everyday traumatic racism, violent, iterative, interruptive, erratic, plays out on streets and neighborhoods. The quick stab of hate speech, the precarious moments of stop and search, the 8.46 minutes it takes to kill George Floyd on the side of a public thoroughfare in Minnesota. These risky moments of, in which life and death hang by a string, these risks to minority living that end up under political encouragement as risks to minority lives themselves find their voice in the haunting evocations of the poem from Rankine that I just read you. That is Rankine's call to poetic justice in the midst of criminal injustice because white policemen protected by the legal doctrine of qualified immunity cannot police their imaginations. Black people are dying. Black lives do not matter. This is a condition we might conceptualize 
as the burdened life, not Giorgio and Gamben's bare life. Traumatic racism keeps you anxious and uncertain, but it also keeps you vigilant in the cause of freedom and the witness of justice. James Baldwin knew this only too well, which is why his personal life and his literary work were built around psychic, social, and political risk. Risk is where we can actually show forms of agency that in fact, we are being asked to give up. To, we, to have to take the risk, uh, Baldwin says, that if we could accept ourselves as minorities, as who we are, we might bring a new life to the Western achievements and their transformations. The price of this is the unconditional freedom of the black man in America. It is not too much to say that black men and women must now be embraced at no matter what psychic or social risk. And we should add here Native Americans. We should add here the LGBTQ community, which has been largely, uh, which has been largely uh, uh, discriminated against. And of course, as of last night, we should add here larger numbers of minorities. And this is not simply a list calling for minorities. These are people who have lived, worked through the pandemic. Blacks, Latinas, and uh, Pacific Islanders are amongst the largest group of essential workers. They have died in larger proportions, and now they're being killed by racism in larger proportions. James Baldwin's ethic of psychic and social risk as a mode of repair and reparation across races and ethnicities picked up as much on the street as from narratives of literature and history is where my friends, I want to end and now how I want to begin my conversations with you. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you for your company. Homi, thank you very much indeed for such uh, a wide ranging and thought provoking talk. There's gonna be lots to discuss. I'm now going to invite Wale Adebamwe and first Elizabeth Fraser to respond to your talk. I've asked Liz and Wale to start their comments by saying a little bit about how their own research interests fit with the topic we're discussing tonight. So Liz, over to you. I would Thank you. Thank you very much, Homi, for that marvellous um, address, which I was lucky enough to have a copy of and, and was able to read it the other day. I'm responding from my discipline of political theory. I spend my time trying to think about what politics is and what it ought to be and how democracy might be realised politically. And it is that question of democratic fragility that I've focused on first, and then the question of violence, and also the question of time, which um, you mentioned in, in your address. So you ask us whether the phrase democratic fragility is a distinctive note of alarm, and I think it is. But I don't know how alarmed we should be about democratic fragility as such, as opposed to the crises of democracy, which we are seeing in many polities at the moment. Because I think it's true that, that dem democracy is fragile and it always has been. And it's a kind of fragility that is at the same time a citation of its exceptional strength. The democratic hope and the democratic bet is that democracy is fragile in the way that porcelain is fragile. In the right physical circumstances, porcelain is exceptionally strong and powerful. And our hope has to be that democracy has a fragility that is like that. 
it's not fragile in the way that a badly structured piece of porcelain is. Obviously, we can imagine pieces of porcelain that won't stand up to drying or to firing or to daily use, but used, done in the right way. Democracy, here's the bet, is less fragile than the brittle authoritarian and autocratic uh, systems that um, come and go. Some of them, of course, last, last a very, very long time. I want to argue that democracy and US democracy, like all others, is ever fragile and ever must be so, and that as democratic members of the polity, that's what we need to know about it and um, value about it. I agree, obviously, that Trumpism is, was a race project. It has to be a race project. It couldn't be anything else. And it is important to remember that populism in the United States since the 19th century, the populism of Andrew Jackson, has always been um, racially, uh, it's always been racially organised, and it has to be because the polity has, is premised on the annihilation of the people who were there before the European settlers, on the exploitation of trafficked slaves whose subsequent liberation, as Baldwin reminds us, is a continued reproach to the value of freedom as that is realised in democracies and in other polities. The anxieties that Jackson exploited were racial. They were white nativist. Talk of anti-elitism and anti-Washington, Washington the city, not Washington the president, has to echo with the civil war, with states' rights and the ambivalences at best of democratic freedoms in thoroughly racialized societies and cultures, which is, it's fair to say, most societies and cultures that we know about in the globe today. In Europe too, populism has to be a race project given Europe's colonial history and all the associated ambivalences of freedom and independence in the given of global capitalism and the histories of ethnicity and polity. Because Polities make efforts at maintaining their internal boundaries of class and inevitably, invariably, of race and ethnicity as they maintain internal religious boundaries, for example, or regional ones. So, of course, auth autocracies all polities are engaged in that political work of working on their own boundaries, both external and internal. And it's that work of, of uh, that boundary work that has to be held to account, has to be always questioned at the bar of freedom and democracy itself. So, Today we're talking about paranoia and uh, you quoted Hannah Arendt on tribal nationalism. It's important to see that for her, the logic of tribal nationalism and indeed for her, the logic of the nation state as she understood it in The Origins of Totalitarianism is genocidal. And the mechanism includes paranoia, as your quote from her, your citation from her, made plain. And you also mentioned the way tyrannical leaders like Trump and others take risks with inflationary cycles of untruth that put the lives and livelihoods of their followers at risk. That's an important issue, I think, because that puts the authoritarians, the tyrants themselves at risk, of course, especially those for whom populism is their vehicle. They cannot deliver what they promise. And so they become fearful, rationally so, but fear in 
individuals like Trump and Modi and Erdogan and others will be, as it were, acted out irrationally. And of course, it can generate violence. It's one of the sources of violence. And it's one I think we might want to consider today. Tyrants have to hold on to, to power for fear that they'll be killed once the paraphernalia of power, their security forces, their wealth and so on is lost. And so they, become, they get stuck in what we hope actually is a vicious circle. The worst is that they manage to keep their, keep their power structures going and evade um, the just desserts that from the democratic and egalitarian and libertarian point of view they ought to they ought to meet that's one of the reasons why democracy has at its heart this um this mechanism that was so important in the last uh, presidential election, the peaceful, relatively peaceful at any rate, transfer of power. It's not wrong for us to keep, keep on about that and how that's at the heart of democratic polities. So the democratic bet is that the peaceful transfer of power means that leaders don't have to fear being killed or imprisoned when they um, lose their power to govern. But the democratic bet, I think, can't be based on the unity that Biden and other presidents proclaim, and that is at the heart of a good deal of United States um, political culture. Because that call for unity doesn't do justice to the deep fissures of the society and the polity, the way that democracies are pre-structured to exclude people. The democratic bet is that we have to continue to make an effort to include into the polity those who are excluded and that that is the best way to confront paranoia and violence. But of course, the problem is that social and political divisions can be structured emotionally so that one person's inclusion is felt as another's exclusion. We've seen white's sense of dispossession when black people are present, either singly or in crowds. We've seen the backlash when male institutions are opened to women. The backlash is fueled in part, I think, by paranoia. That's what's notable about Trump. He shares it with Bolsonaro, with Orban, with Erdogan and Modi. What's notable is the closeness of paranoia and hate in their speeches and the way their speeches undoubtedly license hate and the acting out of it, as we saw again yesterday, in their supporters. I do think that from the point of view of democratic theory, our call shouldn't be for unity or anything like it. And I think we have to approach Hannah Arendt's common mankind category very cautiously, but we should follow Arendt in the way she, as a political thinker, constantly asked us to encounter each other. And I think it's that that we have to call for now encounter, which includes, as it were, meeting and listening and engaging. And we have to think about political nonviolence. We can't think about political nonviolence without considering all the meanings of violence. And we have to think how a political process to realize democracy could look and where violence would be, as it were, put in relation to that, to that project. Because clearly at the moment, the way the settlement up to now has been that it's put into the hands of the police, put into the hands of the military, put into the auspices of the criminal justice system, and that isn't working.
I was really interested in what you've said just today about time. Politics does have to have a contrary relation to time. It has to focus on possible futures. It always has to focus on promise, I think. And again, we can look to Hannah Arendt for that. But it's interesting that we have to work out a genuinely political orientation to time, which is unlike, very unlike, the fantasies of Trump and Modi and McCarthy. They were based on, a, on the very perverse temporality of revenge. And I think we need to think about futures and future promises in relation to politics, in relation to encounter. Those are just my first responses to your inspirational talk. Thanks very much for giving it. Thank you very much, Liz. And um, I mean, rather than respond straight away, why don't we go straight to Wale? And Wale, if you want to make some comments or ask questions, thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Omi, for that very illuminating uh, uh, paper, which I had the opportunity to read. Um, there are so many things that uh, uh, I would like to raise, but I know we have limited time, so I will just raise you know, uh, two issues. Um, I am interested in questions of the social mobilization of power and interest in society, especially how these in intersect with the questions of what I call the politics of life. Uh, so I am particularly interested in how uh, your paper uh, raises some very interesting questions for me uh, in this area. So I would pick up two of these issues and which I would uh, like you to uh, respond uh, to. Uh, the first is regarding the question of the fragility of democracy, uh, which you raised, especially in the context of, of what has been described as uh, ethno-nationalist tribal democracies. So um, I'm wondering why, what you think about the almost exclusive focus uh, in liberal responses and, and liberal prescriptions uh, about the moment, uh, about the racial animals at the center of what we are witnessing at the moment, and the emphasis by many liberal thinkers on the economic anxieties that they, they argue are behind all of this and that that should be our focus. But it seems to me that your argument here is that we need to focus on the core of the racial animals, which is behind what we are witnessing. So I was wondering uh, how you respond to uh, this you know, um, position by some and liberal thinkers that uh, the question is a question of, the issue of the moment is a question of um, economic anxieties and not uh, racial animals, especially in terms of the direct threat that these, you know, uh, ethno-nationalist tribal, you know, um, uh, responses around the world pose to the project of uh, liberal democracy. So uh, the other question that I'm also interested in is uh, the point that you made about body life, which I find fascinating. I, I think it's a very useful you know, concept to think with. And I'm particularly interested in this against the backdrop of you know, the Fanonian tension, which I think is you know, uh, reflected in this concept of uh, body life, especially as the way in which you address this you know, Fanonian tension in, in your book, The Location of Culture. So I'm wondering um, how the concept of body life, you know, represents a counter or perhaps an improvement upon, you know, Agamben's idea of uh, their life. And um, I would like you to um, illuminate how the body life provides a better way to understand the conditions of the moment than uh, their life. Uh, especially, you know, in relation to some of the questions that you have raised, you know, uh, in your paper uh, about, you know, race, you know, uh, caste and different manifestations of this identity crisis, you know, around the world. Thank you. Thank you, Wale. Thank you, Liz, as well. Homi, the, the responses have raised so many questions as well. So rather than me selecting one for you to answer, why don't you respond to any of the points that have been made that struck you? 
you know, one of my great pleasures in life is cooking. And one of the ways, the, the, and, and I mentioned that because I love these conversations around a table where I've spent half a day making the dinner. Now, this is not a dinner party. This is not a seminar. This is a public event. So I have to thank you for raising such remarkable questions, which helped me to grow this idea or the seeds of this idea. But Stephen, since this is not a dinner party and since this is not just a seminar, you're gonna to have to stop me. So just stop me in my tracks, but I'm gonna try quickly to address these really, not only incredibly incisive and important questions. In fact, in many cases, we, are, you know, we agree with each other. I just want to, as Elizabeth, thank you so much. I just want to develop one or two things and ask you, because you know, this is not my wheelhouse, uh, you know, I'm always wheeling around in wheelhouses that are not mine, but it is yours. You know, I think that you made a very interesting observation about the, in a way, the necessary, if I'm getting, the necessary fragility of democracy, the necessary fragility, because if it hardened, we would get the brittleness of autocracy. So, but therefore that made me think just on my feet here listening to you, that it depends on some things. We keep saying in a rather banal way, it depends on the notion of the common good, the common good. But you know, people don't meet each other on the street and say, now let's embrace the common good. How do we establish the common good? Let's try and think about it just for a minute institutionally. In a democratic system, one moment in which, or one institutional moment in which we think of the common good, I think is the possibility of bipartisan uh, uh, bipartisan debate, discussion, by the possibility of negotiation, where some institutions, some institutions uh, are ecumenical. They're not part of any party political thing. In Britain, generally, you used to have the civil service, which uh, uh, you assume that. You also have a cabinet where people are responsible to their constituencies. In America, you absolutely don't have that. In India, many, many, as you know, elections and uh, are, are, are so maneuvered that you get, you, you elect your entire block of people by fair means or foul. So if you don't have some equitable notion of bipartisan negotiation with dignity and on all sides, I think it's very difficult to maintain the productive parts of the fragility of democracy. And here, I just want to mention that we believed in legal institutions. The faith in legal institutions, both in the United States because of this, because politics here, the success of uh, Mitch McConnell is to try in any way possible to have judges appointed. That is the fundamental interest to have judges appointed and in a way, sorry to use this phrase, but to steal the courts and there's no embarrassment about it. And that I think is, that's one of the reasons why now we're in a very difficult position. I grew up in India, my father was a lawyer. He always said the Supreme Courts and the high courts in India are just and fair places. Nobody will say that about the about the high court, about the Supreme Court, leave alone any of them. Nobody will say that about the Supreme Court in India. Of course, there are wonderful judges and brave judges, but I think once bipartisanship and all the, the notion of the democratic dialogue as a negotiatory dignified uh, contribution, once that dies, and then once other institutions like the courts go, then we are really into a very, very difficult play, place. And I just want to say it's that's why I wanted to make this distinction. And I think that takes me to Wale's excellent points to between what I call our, our emphasis on systemic inequality, which has been at the forefront of our minds, systemic inequality and systemic racism, which have been in the forefront of our minds, both with the coronavirus and the public health system, and indeed with the, uh, with the uh, protest movements. You know, this has been absolutely central uh, to us. But I'm therefore trying to suggest in my new work that there is a, there is, there, that systemic and traumatic, systemic racism 
or systemic inequality and traumatic inequality, if I could translate it, are not the same thing. They have a different temporal structure. They happen in different places. The involvement of the biopolitical is different. The way in which the ethics of the body, the way in which sexuality, all these things are differently attacked between the systemic and the traumatic. And in my sense then, I think we must think, even people who are outside this field must think about the traumatic more. And I think you, because 8.46 minutes on a street in Minnesota, and it, the video that came of it, and the movement, that is the basis of traumatic. People knew about the systemic racism. So to reduce these moments of the traumatic of everyday living, Wally, to go back to your point, to reduce them always to be just epiphenomena of a given systemic racism does not allow us to understand our history and the narratives, the modalities, the George Floyd murals across the world. Why did people choose to make murals across the world from Syria to, to, to Iraq, to, to Berlin, to Bombay? So I just think we need to widen our notions of how governance happens and how the systemic and the traumatic the citizen is both in that, in both the systemic situation, but is also in the traumatic situation. And this is something that I think the ethics of the, the political ethics, and of course, for me, also the cultural ethics of the, um, of the traumatic are very important. And finally, I just want to therefore say, Wally, that this is my way of bridging between Elizabeth and you and saying, for me, uh, I, the phrase came to me, during this whole period of the pandemic, it's not just the politics of, 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 it's not just the risk to death or the risk to life. It is also the risk of living. This thought came to me when I was studying the comorbidity question as a form of biopolitics in America. Just think of it. People who are known to have comorbidities largely Latinos, Pacific uh, Islanders, um, uh, uh, and, and Blacks, they already have comorbidities. These comorbidities are a reflection of their poverty, their inability, their housing conditions. Now, these people who have the comorbidities are now mobilized as your essential workers. And when they're mobilized as your essential workers and they get coronavirus, the response is, oh, well, you know, we expect this kind of mortality or morbidity rate because they had comorbidities. You know, what are you trying to pull? And that's why I began to think of the risk to living under these conditions. And of course, you're right, Fanon has it. You know, when he talks about the, when I think about the burdened life, this concept I'm trying to develop, it comes out of when Fanon says that on the street, in a moment of traumatic racism, he's confronted by a child who looks at him and turns to his mother and says, oh my God, mother, look, this is a black person. I'm frightened, I'm frightened. And he said, at that point, I have to read my, my whole historical past is on my back. The misrepresentations of my historical past are on my back. The, 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 the notion of racism, which has got nothing to do, which is may, it may, could be an enlightenment idea, that falls on me too. And I have to take responsibility for all of this. And I am at risk. That's why I think the burdened life with its various narrativities is much more, for me, productive than the analogical thinking that, uh, of the bare life, which kind of reduces agency. Fano gives this example. He says, I'm burdened with all this, I'm attacked, but I have to recompose myself and I will recompose myself. Same with Baldwin. I'm hit by these risks, but I will take the risks since I'm most at risk and I will work with it. That's why I prefer the agency oriented notion of, uh, 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 of, of the notion of the burdened life and which is what I'm trying to develop in my book. I'll just finish in a minute by saying, you know, the English translation, the, sorry, the English edition of uh, the origins of totalitarianism was titled The Burden of Our Times. And I proudly have a copy of it just up there in my study. 
Thank you very much. Let's Thank you. I'm sorry to have taken time, no, but no, no, these were such right. fabulous questions. I couldn't no, no, great questions. And I, I can stop you at any point by just pressing the mute button, but I don't want to because I'm enjoying the conversation so much. Um, the, um, it's the power of Zoom, isn't it? I'm going to bring in questions from people watching now. Is that OK? And I'll bring those into the conversation. Um, and uh, we've had a few. And if you want to ask a question, please do just pop it into the, um, the YouTube chat. But a question actually for Wale, if I may, which comes out of what you've just been saying. So Wale, you asked about the relationship between the current fragility of democracy and economic realities. Yeah. And the question is, does psychological reality play a role here? And how should we confront this reality productively? Tiffany, is that for me or for Omi? That's for you, Wale, actually. Okay. In the oh, first okay. oh yes yeah I, I i think that um the which i mean reflecting on um omi's paper i think that the question of the moment about you know uh, racial identity and the ways in which this constitute the form of our life that you know our life our lives are at stake precisely because of our racial category would mean that you know it does not take away the economic anxieties. And they, of course, they, um, as you know, Omi just articulated it, uh, oftentimes uh, racial category can be tied directly to uh, the limitations uh, the inequalities that exist, you know, our economic, and uh, that produce, you know, our economic anxieties. But I think that it's critical for us at this moment to recognize, to go back to the boys, perhaps to say that the question of the age, <laughs> Uh, it calls it the, the color question. So I think that we need to rethink that and understand how that is at the basis of the economic you know, uh, injustices in some of these societies that we're describing. Um, some of very, very interesting things that have happened in the last you know, um, two decades, especially under Obama in the United States, where you find poor white people who insisted on being against Obamacare because they thought this was a program that was going to benefit minorities. So you can see this whole thing about, you know, uh, the question that, you know, um, Homie raised about the epiphenomenon, the way in which people are so tied to the issue of the category of the identity that they, they are not in any way ready to listen to any questions about the possibilities that will make life better for everybody. In fact, some people would say, that they would rather not have a better life if that better life would be afforded to that minorities. So, so this is the kind of you know um, questions in my mind when I was trying to ask you know um, wh why I asked uh, Omi to uh, to to um, expand on the very very, very critical po point that he raised about the racial question as you know a very important question of of the moment. Uh, can I just say one thing? You're absolutely right. And I think the example you've given is that there are refusers for the rights of minorities. They, it is not that they make economic calculation. You know, they don't do a cost benefit thing. They don't even know that. They're not even addressed as citizens with the, that information. But if you think about it, the killing of the Asians last night why? Because they said the coronavirus may have come from, from China. I mean, what does that have to do with their economic uh, notion of dispossession? You're absolutely right. Well, there is something in the racial in many countries, and I'm also in the minoritarian, that does not allow people of equal economic dispossession to come together. There is something in our politics now that will not allow people to say, these are the issues we should be fighting for together to go back to Elizabeth and really bringing in race, bringing in Islam, Muslims in India. This is not relevant to the issue. We, you know, maybe it's a failure of secular politics that we've not been able to make people think that there is something affective Right, there is something really affective, emotional, that does and cultural that cannot simply that has to be dealt with and worked with, and cannot simply be um, uh, be measured uh, on on sort of economic equality. That's why I'm thinking about this notion of traumatic racism. You know, you can be a citizen and you can be traumatized, and because it's not when you're traumatized, it's not about 
it, it, it's not about equality. You're traumatized because of the color of your skin, because you're a woman, a particular ki kind of woman or whatever, a kind of man, and you're traumatized, your dignity is destroyed and you're denigrated. I believe, and this is controversial, the denigration of this kind, humiliation of this kind, has a kind of genocidal thought behind it. It's not that it is really genocide, let me be clear. It would fail the test of the genocide convention, but I'm saying it's about saying, these people don't belong here. This, this you know, they're up, out, they're outside of the, of, of the realm of humanity. I believe denigration, more even than inequality is about saying, you're another kind, just get out of my sight. And sight is so important in these racial moments. Thank you. Um, can we turn to a, a different sort of question now? Um, the question is, do you think incarcerated people should be able to vote? Which of course speaks to a broader issue when we're thinking about democracy of who actually gets to vote, which has been such an issue in America throughout uh, history, but obviously has been such a headline issue recently. You mentioned, Homi, about um, how many people think the election was stolen, but also you had the work of Stacey Abrahams and others to expand the franchise. Now, I mean, I'll ask the question as a historian as well, which is, of course, America is one of the very few countries where the franchise has been severely restricted in the past through democratic means. I mean, with violence attached, but through the ballot box. Um, I mean, what are your reflections about the electrical, electoral process in, in relation to the idea of um, the fragility of democracy and, the, and your specific answer to the question of should incarcerated people be able to vote? So I really think that this is Elizabeth's, uh, this is one for her, really. Let's hand it across. In fact, I should have asked you straight off, Elizabeth. So over to you. I'm going to ask you, Elizabeth, to, yes. to get in on this one. Please do. Okay, so um, I think that within, yeah, I think that up to a point, definitely, definitely, yes. <clears throat> there's, a re there's a traditional Republican argument, which is the incarceration is the loss of citizenship or loss of citizenship is the real, real point of the punishment. So that's why prisoners shouldn't, shouldn't vote. But that it seems to me that Okay, it depends if we think that um, punishment is for revenge, in which case it's all of a piece with the forms of vengeful, vi vengeful and angry, hateful violence that we, we do have in our democracies and in our autocracies at the moment, that prisoners shouldn't be able to vote. So an aim for a progressive politics, which is fully alive to the fact that individuals and groups in particular are traumatised, that we do encounter each other as burdened others and as um, people who need help and so forth. If that's what a polity ought to be, which I think it ought to, there is definitely, definitely no reason to deprive prisoners of voting rights are, you know, absolutely none. I really think that that's got to be true. I'm really interested though in thinking about, I would always want to argue for a theory of democracy, which doesn't see the vote as the central yeah, yeah, democratic yeah. moment. It's a democratic moment to be sure. And it is one that is freighted with symbolism and indeed is very fateful because it actually ushers in governments or ushers in policies. So I'm not saying it's not anything, <clears throat> but it isn't at the heart of democratic politics. I think that what's at the heart of any politics is an encounter. Now, I think it's absolutely right that that's encounters between, as it were, injured people, traumatised people and that we can't be we can't impose you know overly rationalistic demands on the political and the democratic process but something has to be done to to address the incapacities to encounter 
especially across the great divides of race and ethnicity and religion and sex and class, but also between, you know, more local groups and different others, because that, you know, that it, it happens at a more micro level as well, that people evade each other. And I do think that fear, which turns so quickly to anger, which has become a dominant affect of our time, is, an, is really, really um, frightening. But we also do have occasions for encounter. And it does mean that we're going to have to encounter the... We have to encounter the people who invaded the um, capital. And it, uh, it was bothersome to me that... Biden's address didn't, as it were, really speak to them as opposed to about them. Um, and I was wondering what Homie actually thought about that. It, I mean, it was a kind of, sorry, it, it was a question that was rather implicit in what I was saying about encounter, which involves speaking to rather than about. Thank you, Homie. Thank you. Yeah, that cross the cross, Homie. Do you, do you want to respond to that? Yeah, um, I, I think I think that's absolutely right. Um, I th that we have to think about encounter, but uh, and I think that Biden should have. I think he tried to in his way, but I think what you were saying earlier, uh, Liz, makes great sense. That by just think by just trying to confront the obvious division by unity is really not to encounter. And I think that's the very strong point you made that by just keep, and Obama did the same thing. There are no red states, there are no blue states. We're all kind of purple states. You know, that's not true. So I think that, but, but what are the mechanisms of encounter? I'm just beginning to think again institutionally, which is not part of my discipline. We talk about, about poetic measures or about, you know, but on narrative, but one of the great encountering institutions is education. That is where people learn to encounter, you know, including curricula, including, but these institutions are becoming so steeped in poverty and are becoming racialized. They're becoming, you know, I think this is as true in England in, in the public system as it is here. They're just becoming uh, laboratories, petri dishes of polarization. They're petri dishes of polarization. So I think if we don't create encounter at that level, it's very difficult then just to say, you know, reach out to your neighbor. You know, my neighborhood here has the most wonderful Black Lives Matter in various languages. Everybody's welcome. Most, you know, many people near their houses put it on. And this is Cambridge, Massachusetts. But what are the mechanisms that make us encounter? And what are the mechanisms that make us encounter in the spirit of alterity? Not in the spirit that that which we do not immediately understand is worth interpreting. That's where I think humanistic, uh, you know, the humanities comes in. What you don't recognize immediately is worth taking a step further. Thank you very much. And of course, that raises so many questions, doesn't it? Even about the very structure of uh, the American landscape and suburbanization and so forth, when we think about um, encounter. Well, we could talk about this one for a long time, but we're coming nearly to a close. So can I just ask two or three very quick questions as, as we close? Um, and one question, let's ask this one to, um, I think it's to Wale actually. Um, do the terms tribal nationalism and ethnic nationalism imply that it is possible to have a nationalism that is not either of those things? Well, um, it is very difficult. And uh, I was actually, you know, um, quoting uh, so from um, Homi's paper when I talked about the ethno-nationalist tribal democracies. And I think this is supposed to be, you know, um, um, a phrase that captures different dimensions of, you know, ethnic states, you know, ethno-nationalist movement, you know, uh, the politics of tribalism, 
which now happens perhaps in the most supposedly cosmopolitan context. Uh, so uh, in that context, I think it was the, it's, it's the attention to the politics of negation, which is at the heart of these kinds of mobilizations around those forms of identity. Of course, there is a conundrum there because sometimes people also have to mobilize you know, for egalitarian politics on the basis of these identities to be able to counter you know, dominant oppressive systems in, 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 in their particular context. But I think the, the point you know, uh, being made or, originally was about the, the limitations you know, that exist here. And I think this connects to the question that you know, um, uh, uh, Liz raised earlier um, in response to Omi, which, I, which I'm interested in pursuing about how the question of unity uh, can be not just the conditions for limitations and negation, but also conditions of possibilities especially when you look at the ways in which Biden, Obama were trying to mobilize this. So it more of, you know, a, a politics of, um, of some wishes of, you know, some, some wishes around a future, that is, a future that is imagined than a response to contemporary challenges. So I'm wondering about how unity can be both, you know, um, conditions of possibilities as well as conditions of negation of the reality of the challenges of the moment. Thank you, Wale. So, pass on across to you, Homie, and then we'll, we'll have time for one more question after that. So, yeah. Over. Um, just two things that my friends here have said, and I just want to respond to. I'll come to Wale in a minute. And But uh, but Liz, the, the, the de-emphasizing the voting. I just heard, an, it's a very important point. If the whole system is rigged, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter who goes to the voting booth or not. And I just heard Rahul Gandhi talk about that at the moment, saying, really, you know, voting is only the end process. It's all the institutions have been taken over, they're captured. We, as an opposition party, cannot even move anymore. We don't know where to go. He said, at the end of the day, of course, the votes are going to uh, fall the way they do. So I think you're absolutely right. Voting is only the final moment or symptom of a whole system. And I think the fact that now there is so much opposition to the freedom of voting says something in the imagination, in the political and ethical imagination about the lack of any, any real status of voting itself. So I agree with you there. And, and um, Wale, just to uh, go back to you, to uh, the, the, the point you made, you know, I, this is what I feel. I think that the moment we're in is the moment we're in, you know, as uh, Bob Dylan once said, you know, it's difficult to, but in this moment too, and I lie, and people think of me as an optimist, you won't believe it. But in this moment too, I do think the Me Too movement, the Occupy Wall Street movement, the, 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 the Arab Spring movement, now the Black Lives Matter movement, I do think in, in India, the farmer strike, the, the agitation against citizenship, your, what happened in London, the last of my, you know, which is also partly my hometown, what happened in London two weeks ago in Tottenham, you know, those moments I think are a sign of the bringing together of what Adorno and Bloch once called disappointed hope. My book very much talks about this, that disappointed hope is what gives you the, 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 the right to resist, as, but does not allow you to be utopian. You know, aspiration is fine, but there has to be a sense of alterity and tension in that aspiration. And I think that, you know, the, it's interesting that these are seen to be moments, you know, they're not seen to be long histories. But maybe that's something that this work that I'm trying to do with traumatic racism and its temporality, it's made me revalue. What is it about shorter movements in our political moment? What do they reflect? And how do you build on them? And what are their values? And I think this is a very important issue. I just want to say all the Black Lives Matter writing, they refer to what happened as a moment. They yeah. don't refer to it as an event or a history. That's the temporal frame. Thank you. Thank you. Liz, did you want to make a... Yeah, well, because I, I wanted to say that I think Disappointed Hope is a really marvellous basis for, for action, but what it cannot licence is hate. 
And somehow or another, it is true that we are living through a time seemingly when hate has been licensed, as it has been in past, you know, in, in other historical eras. And what makes hate run down the drain, you know, I don't know. I don't want to be too optimistic in this moment of talking about dem democratic encounter and democratic um, political temporalities and so on, because it can sound a bit, it can sound utopian. Um, th there is something about the way that fear and hate are self-defeating and the revenge always redounds on the avenger that d must get through, but only if we actually talk to these guys. Thank, uh, you. thank you. Um, Homie, we're going to have to finish Sadie um, reasonably shortly. Can we? Can I ask a final question, which is a couple of questions that are coming through the chat. Uh, I mean, as Liz was just saying, we were we were going to we pre-planned that our final question was going to be about what next and um, our, all the sort of things you've been talking about, Liz. But the questions that have come in are actually rather more practical, not okay. where are we going next, but what should people do next? And so um, I'm going to ask the whole panel um, this. So one question comes in um, saying, what are the channels for protest at present? And another one specifically for academics in the light of the resignation of um, Pratap Mehta from uh, university and criticism of people like Audrey Trushka and so forth from the outside. What is the ethical imperative or the way forward for academics, particularly humanities academics in this moment? So there you are, a couple of questions talking about practical things that uh, academics um, should consider looking forward. So can I just throw that open to the panel? Should we start with Liz or, or I would Wally like and, then, to have and then finish the last, with Homie? No, no. I, would, I would like Homie to have the last word, but can I just say, yes, I, don't, exactly. I don't think I've got anything to say about the academics thing. We have to defend the right to protest and there's a bill going through the UK Parliament at the moment, which gives the government appalling powers to say when a protest is a nuisance and, you know, be able and the police um, are able to. There's a real there's a real dislike of the right to protest almost as uh, of protest almost as bad as the dislike of other people getting things, you know, being willing to do without it yourself. But what we mustn't say about the um, January the 6th people is that they should not have protested. I think that the right to protest and its limits and its constraints and its meanings has absolutely got to be defended because authoritarian and autocratic and tyrannical rulers will always go for that. They will also go for the academics. They will also go for the universities, as Homie has been saying. But I think thank that's you, well, thank you, Liz. Sorry, I didn't. I didn't mean to interrupt you there. The, the, uh, the screen went um, quiet on me for a moment. Um, thank you, Wale. Any final thoughts from you? Yes, I have just read a brilliant uh, essay this morning, which I recommend. Uh, which is the title is "The Radical Libra in White Rose," and I think the core argument in in, in, in this uh, essay, which I agree with, is that we must defend the Libra project. The liberal project is not a Western project. It's not the project of any corner of the world. It's a collective project because that's the most important way by which we can defend the universal project of our common humanity. And there are all sorts of challenges to the liberal project in the present moment, but it's the basis, if you look at it deeply, by which we can actually formulate it, the, the idea of the universal in which we do not exclude particularities, but we are able to bring all those particularities into a common front to defend our common humanity. And I think that's the challenge of our age. Thank you. Thank you. And then, Homie, to you for a final word. Well, first of all, thank you all very much. And I want to thank the audience. 
uh, for listening to us all. I've had a wonderful time. Thank you. Um, thank you, Stephen and, and uh, uh, Elizabeth and Wally and Wes. Um, I, I think there are, I want to say three things. One, I think that there is a, and, and I, I'm going to try and uh, um, uh, tilt them towards the education. I think there is a huge need to, to, to found institutions, and I think cultural institutions can play this role, not only universities, to begin to think about, um, about civic and cultural cultural rights, not simply political and social and economic rights, going back to what Wally said. I think that so many of the issues that create hate and fear are based on interpretations, misinterpret misinterpretations, misrecognitions, not only of identities, but of ideas, of traditions, of cultures, of modes of behavior. So I think it's extremely important to be able to think about the ethnography of the ethics of civic and civil um, uh, 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 participation. And I use the word ethnography because I'm saying this is a matter of education. The thing that is strange to you, the stranger whose language you don't speak, but is your neighbor. This is not the first and easiest thing to do, but it is an essential thing to do if you think about the civic and the neighborly in that way. So I think that's uh, extremely important. I very much take the point about hate. Why do we have so much hate? I just think, and this is a completely speculative problem, but one issue that's been in my mind. I think our public life now is so dependent on guilt and the courts and the law. Think about it. All Trump wants to do is not is to get to defy the courts. For him, he all he wants to do is either to be not to be convicted. And so the emphasis is either on this notion of guilt, but the whole question of the ethics of shame, you know, how you, what you denigrate, how you denigrate somebody, how you misrepresent, the notion of shame which depends on a sense of community. I go back to Bernard Williams here, really. That shame, show, and even W.E. Du Bois, that shame is a symptom that you care about where you belong. You know, if I do something crazy uh, on the M5, in, 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 and, and, and on the sub, and, and somebody everybody looks at me and says, oh my God, most shameful, that that's bad. But if I do it where I live, it has a totally different, people don't feel they have that sense of relating to each other, which will not allow them to be shameless and therefore to be human and not humiliating. I think we've got so involved now, you know, who is guilty and who is not? And I think this goes back to your point. As soon as we think about the guilt, then, you know, we have their, our own binarisms. They're in or they're out. But I think shame and what shame means is something, I hope it's clear, is something more humane. Uh, and I think to, to shame people is actually appalling. It is to humiliate, denigrate, and to remove people from the kind of human community. And eventually... I think the right to protest is absolutely um, uh, essential. Uh, like, I, I think there's no question about it, but I think it is a sign of the polarizing, nativist, tri tribalizing politics in which we live, that protest, which is meant to be that you protest for a right, you protest for something, and you do it by presenting yourself in a demonstration, you demonstrate yourself. That whole notion of the openness of being there on a platform for a principle seems now to have become a mob-like movement. And I think there is a difference between a demonstration and a kind of mob response to a problem. And I just wish that we could bring the people from the mob into the demonstrating world and we could work together. Thank you very much. I'm so sorry we have to stop now. It'd be one of those sessions if we were in person where we could run on into the evening for those that want to stay, but uh, we'll need to stop now. So thank you everybody who's been watching and putting questions. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Wes, for 
um, arranging this. And thank you, Maya and Holly, um, behind the scenes and the Torch team for making the whole thing work. Thank you to Liz and uh, Wale for your comments and conversation, and especially Homie, thank you so much. Thank you. For joining us and raising so many issues um, that we'll think about long into the night. Um, Thanks a lot. Good day to you and goodbye to everybody else.